move to our sixth contestant. He is a scientist. He is an explorer, a wanderer, a network security researcher by day, a science communicator extraordinaire by night, with a deep passion for astronomy and the discovery of the unknown. A quarter century millennial reject with dreams of escaping Earth one day and wondering whether anyone out there care to join him. With his presentation titled, How to Get to Mars in Three Minutes or Less, let us hear his three minute presentation. Welcome, Afik Abdul Hamid. Okay, where's the battery? No, I gave it to you. Yeah, it is with me. <laughs> Hello, test, test, one, two, test, one, two. Sorry, I forgot my battery. There you go, much better. Okay. Planet Earth is a prison, and if humanity is to live long and prosper, we must escape it. Mars provides the perfect destination for this escape to happen. But why Mars? Well, Mars has ice that can be melted for water. Mars receives enough sunlight to allow the use of solar panels for energy. And a Martian day is only 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. Mars is not as hot and hellish as Venus, or as cold and barren as the moon. So to quote Goldilocks and the three bears, it's just right. But how do we get there? What are the challenges involved? If you want to, as Arnold Schwarzenegger put it, get your ass to Mars, you would need a powerful rocket to escape the pull of Earth's gravity. The most powerful rockets are not a single rocket, but are in fact many rockets combined into one multi-stage rocket that maximizes thrust output by dropping the parts that have spent their fuel during the ascent to escape Earth. Altogether, such a rocket looks something just like this. But getting to Mars requires you to launch this rocket at just the right time. Since Mars and Earth go around the sun at different speeds. They are sometimes very far from each other and at other times much closer together. In astronomy, this is called an opposition or a close approach. It's a cosmic window of opportunity that appears every two years when the two planets are in the perfect positions to launch a rocket from Earth to Mars with the least amount of fuel needed to make the total 300 million mile journey across space. But the most important thing I'm telling you right now is that you pack extra underwear because we'll be away in space for seven to eight months and I am not sharing. So when you're ready, get yourself a toothbrush and we'll set a date for the next Mars Close Approach in May of 2018. About one year from now, we will launch eastwards near the equator to get a gravitational assist from the Earth's rotation like a form of giant planetary catapult. This is Mission Control, launching T, minus four, three, two, one, liftoff! The journey of a thousand light years begins with a single orbit. Our journey to Mars will set us on a course called the Mars Transfer Orbit. Once our spacecraft has left Earth, it must be pointed in the right direction. You cannot just shoot for where Mars is at launch. You have to adjust your aim for where it will be when you get there. This will involve thrust maneuvers to correct your course so you don't miss Mars and accidentally hit Pluto, which is totally not a planet, by the way. Your teacher lied to you. <laughs> now, landing on Mars is a different story entirely. This incredible journey has only been embarked upon by machines like the Curiosity rover. But as we are starting to see in the 21st century, Earth is becoming too small a home for the entire human family. One day, our descendants will embark on this journey, not out of curiosity, but out of necessity. 
and they will look back at all of us as the generation that bravely took the first step forward. Thank you, and safe journeys. Wow. So, so Afik, uh, uh, Afik, 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 uh, please, no destruction of properties here. <laughs> How, how much of underwear is enough for me to pack to go to Mars? Seven to eight months. Seven to eight months. So what? Seven pairs? Enough? Uh, assuming that you wear one pair every month. Uh, okay, go, go. That's the point of so, recycling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, let us shoot your rockets to the judges. <laughs> Hi, Afik. Hi, Mr. Judge. This one I, you could not get any better. <laughs> um, fine. We have to do our... My job is to ask you. So, Willie Ames, when he took over the AI approach to NASA, said that if we were ever to really make Mars mission a success, we cannot rely on human beings. We must rely on artificial intelligence. So, for that journey, the problem in teaching it in school is the natural tendency is for students to think of it in a straight line. 150 million kilometers, depending on orbit, whatever it is. But as you illustrated, we need to navigate the best way. And in the movies where one person was left on Mars, when they had to recalculate, that's exactly where we want our students to be. Uh, yes. Right? So if I were to ask you this question, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, it sounds so complex. How do we get a primary school and secondary school student to attach more to this. How would you teach this, not as an alternative in school, but as the mainstream? Because this is what science is all about. Stephen Hawking last week said that if we don't colonize a new planet in 100 years, mankind would be obliterated. All right, thank you for your question. Uh, well, to address, the, I see two parts in that question. First of all, how to make it relevant to our ade ade up there, all, all the kids out there who are intrigued at exploring Mars, but would rather be playing Dota and video games instead. With the advent of virtual reality, the headset that you wear, you can take them there without actually taking them there, but it, it will feel very realistic. And uh, a lot of training simulations can be done using VR, and artificial intelligence can be used to put in, uh, to simulate a lot of the conditions that we will actually meet when we actually go to Mars, which allows us to get that experience without putting humans in harm's way. Now the second, question, the second part of your question about Stephen Hawking, uh, I will retort it with something that Carl Sagan said, and that is, it would be strategic for humans to become a two-planet species, maybe not within the context of uh, the next 50 years, but we have to one day have a human backup on Mars, so that if something were to happen, here on Earth, humanity in all its glory and mystery and wonder will persevere. Uh, yeah, I'm a gamer myself. I like to play video games. And I think if you get these kids on playing more video games about Mars and using software to simulate all these interesting things that you could do on the red planet, that would really go a long way into making them become more interested. <laughs> all right. He had the judges at underwear. Wow, that's a first. All right, thank you very much, Avik. Thank you for your presentation, and right, please take your underwear. I, yeah, yeah, all yeah. right. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't forget your Mars and yeah. Earth, right. and that cup of McDonald's McCafe coffee. Yeah. Uh, I, by the way, I'm not sponsored by McDonald's. Yeah. It's just <laughs> <laughs> product placement disclaimer. Yeah. What to do? All right, we're halfway there. Six small contestants to go. I think you shouldn't go out from the stage that way. You should go back to the backstage. <laughs> oh my god. All right. <laughs> well, I think being Avik. Okay, thank you very much. Right. It's like I have a golden halo. It's like I'm Lorgar Aurelian right now. Hello, Internet. My name is Son of Terra92, and welcome to this retrospective vlog. What you just watched was my entry into the FameLab 2017 competition. FameLab is a science communication competition, sort of like the Super Bowl Hunger Games of the science communication world. And science communication, the storytelling 
of science is something that I'm very much very keen on. That's exactly what my YouTube channel is about. I talk about space and astronomy because ever since I was about a wee little lad, 16 years old, once I was 16 years old, when I was 16 years old, I fell in love with science in a way that really can't be explained or understood driven by a passion that I can neither articulate nor understand when I picked up Carl Sagan's Cosmos but yeah and FameLab is this competition where you give a three minute presentation on any science topic try to make it fun hip and cool with the kids and I got the chance to enter all the way into the national finals like a couple of weeks ago and uh, what you just watched was my presentation and I hope that you guys liked it thanks for watching and I want to make like this quick video to just give a few thoughts about the competition and my experience in FameLab because I think it was a really awesome experience and uh, it was a really good opportunity for me to do something that I love and honestly while I was preparing for the competition and while I was delivering the presentation I felt alive I felt like unlike any other state of being that I could ever have on a lot of substances it, it felt like some kind of drug can explain yeah <laughs> and, and and it was really cool i met a, a lot of awesome people and uh the winner actually gets to go to sheltonham science festival which you know us millennials we love our festivals and unfortunately Despite how turned up my presentation was, I finished second. But in bed, I always finish first. Hey yo! <laughs> yeah, I finished second, as we shall see right now. This person basically lives on planet Mars. <laughs> anyway, I met a lot of cool people, humble people, smart people during this competition who have a lot of interesting ideas that they want to share with the world. And FameLab is this global competition that unites scientists and science communicators from all over the world. I definitely feel like despite the fact that I lost, I'm definitely going to be back. And what this competition has done for me is that it's tapped into this energy inside of me. I feel like I just want to do it for real. I really just want to pursue this to the ends of the earth. I feel like the competition really brought out in me the best aspects of my human nature as not just a scientist, but also as a human being. I mean, I felt alive during doing this competition. And so to all my supporters out there that came to watch me, I just want to say thanks a bunch. I'm sorry we didn't win, but there will be a lot of great things to come, hopefully from Son of Terror 92 and Science Epic. If you guys out there who are watching enjoy this kind of content and would like to support me, I'd like to point you guys to my Patreon right here. This Patreon is for my ongoing series on astronomy called Thoughts on the Cosmos. It's kind of like a science vlog, musical journey experience type of thing. And you guys can go check that out right there. Or at the very least, uh, like this video or share it with people who you think might appreciate it. Or share it to your, your friends, random friends, doesn't matter, your cat, your dog, your goldfish. I think your goldfish would be into this kind of stuff. I don't know, who knows. What this competition has done for me has really awakened in me a desire to do more and continuously take part in the field of science communi communication. Because even though I lost... I know for a fact that I am good, that I was great on that stage. I was a young, handsome man displaying to the world what he is all about. Young man goes and gets everything he chases, you know. I love hip hop too and I love science communication. I want to make it cool. I want to make this awesome, mix it up in some really nice experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why I lost because the style of my delivery, I guess, it was just way too hip, too cool, too millennial for the judges to handle. And one thing that happened after the, 
the presentation was said and done was that one of the judges pulled me aside and he said that perhaps in some instances that um, an in-your-face presentation may not be suitable to connect to the entire audience in general. Oh yeah, by the way, I got this. This is, they gave this to us. Congratulations, FameLab. So yeah, I got second place doing what I love, but I feel like I've, throughout the competition and preparing for the competition, it's been a wonderful ride. It was, it was just the best, the best. And even though I finished second, I feel like I truly achieved something. And, and the most important thing is, I don't want this feeling to stop. I don't want to go back to the basicness after experiencing FameLab. I don't want to give up on my dreams. And I think becoming a science communicator and walking that path of Carl Sagan and Azalia K. Call me. <laughs> I, I definitely want to pursue this to the ends of infinity and beyond. And I just want to say to you guys, uh, thanks for watching my channel. Thanks for tuning in. I will revamp a lot of my content. I learned a lot during this competition and I feel like I'm going to carry a lot of this momentum into whatever the, all the science communication endeavors that I will pursue in the future. And Dr. Zaid, if you're watching this, you know I'm better than you. You just won't admit it. Peace out. Mm -hmm.